gentlemen, let me start actually by encouraging you and inviting you to move forward if you're in the macro. Now, if you're in the macro, you absolutely have to have electricity, and I understand I'm really offended. But hopefully, we're going to have enough of a dialogue here in a little bit that we can get everybody involved. Let's make the pro step back. Um, I am not just asking them from Joyce State University, and uh, I'm really <coughs> up about games in general. And this discussion of it's very easy to have a very understandable discussion with uh, our colleagues about using games to edit. But they often think about using off the shelf specific design games and even maybe even outside the of the boxes that we're repurposing now so that they become educational in some way. Changing the context, looking at the context this game will do this. They seldom think about changing the rules of education and applying more game like structures to make education itself a process of making fun more like a game. And that is the, the side of game based learning that I'm going to talk about today, specifically uh, an approach that we've developed, adopted, uh, called quest game. And uh, there's always this fear that I have that I'll dive straight into. So what I did is I took what would normally be an entire hour of the paradigm change of education, and I have compressed it into a five-minute Ignite talk. And in typical Chris Haskell style, that five-minute Ignite talk is ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so if I get it under nine, if someone wants to clock me, That'd be fine. I will encourage you, I do have my, my phone up here that I would like to start the conversation here, but I think that it's going to continue, not just for a couple days, but a long time. I mean, uh, we make connections at these conferences, as you can tell by the fact that we're back in the row. Tweet something great, so I say, by the way. If it continues well beyond, and we, we talk all the time throughout the year, we collaborate on things, we bring each other in on projects, and it's fun, it's just fun to play with people. Give what you get. So I'd like to start that conversation. And the best way to do that with us is really through Twitter because I can answer your questions. If nothing else, I've just given you permission to text during the session and pretend like you're engaging. But I need to point out, uh, and I, this happened recently, I presented it to a group of older teachers. Not that this is an old group, I'm not calling out anything like that. But experienced teachers, and I wasn't clear about what Twitter was, some of them thought it was when you pee in your pants a little bit, you tweet. If that's what you think, then please don't tweet. <laughs> or if you get excited easily, don't tweet. You have trouble jumping on trampolines, but you know, you sneeze or laugh and you have to cross your legs, you understand what I'm talking about. So what I would like to do is just start with this, uh, this piece. Um, so the students that we teach, the landscape of education and the role of teachers will change more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100. The shift in the educational paradigm has already begun. It's a, it's a shift that's using internet, mobile devices, and social networks, even video games. They'll play as much of a role in the next century as textbooks, blackboards, and desks have in the last. And let's face it. All classes are a game. We try to figure out what it takes to win from the moment we walk in. We prepare, we interact, study, uh, attend, even talk, uh, built upon assumptions that we make about the winning condition of the course. And these are the characteristics of the hidden game that often distract from learning opportunities. Now, savvy teachers know this and try to slant the game in favor of learning. But students, all students, look at the classroom with a natural question. What do I need to do to get the grade that I want, rather than what's worth knowing and thinking, feeling, or doing? Schools keep us guessing. They deliver quizzes to force a student to study. Uh, we call it responsibility training sometimes. Now, when the student does poorly, we often punish them with no hope of redemption. And we gradually chip away at their success with B's, C's, and D's until it's mathematically impossible for them to be successful. We do this to teach them responsibility. And 
it's the stupidest game that I can think of, and the kids hate to play. The good news is we can change the game, and here's how. We need to eliminate homework. We need to get rid of due dates. We need to give students choice, and we need to let our students play. If this is going to be possible, we as teachers have to do a better job of recognizing and recording learning, the students learning, in all contexts. This means that teachers must move from dictators of learning to observers and promoters of it. And I believe that our role is, as teachers is to loosen the restrictions on how our students learn and apply the context to what they learn. So, first of all, we need to overcome the ideas of the previous system been around for 150 years. We need to acknowledge the difference between fair and equitable. So if, if we're going to differentiate, differentiate instruction for individual students. If we strongly consider it, holding all students to the same path, measures and expectations is not fair. It might be if they were all the same, but they're not. So every student is completely unique, yet the traditional approach to school is to expect every student, regardless of their background, their origin, their history, their interests, their home life, to perform identically under identical conditions. So for us to be fair, we need to create a classroom experience that is, by definition, free from bias, uh, of dishonesty, or injustice. In other words, we need to learn as much about each student as we can, and then we need to tailor an approach that gives them the best chance to be successful. Thus, we make education happen. So let's talk about a couple of the systems that are unfair. Homework. Eliminating homework doesn't mean that students will fail to think or create outside the bounds of our classroom. It simply means that we're not going to regulate that behavior and in kind of punish when it doesn't happen. For the most part, homework does a better job of telling us which parents are better at regulating their children's uh, outside of school life than it does how much the student True, the more time spent engaging in a subject matter authentically uh, outside of class, the more the student will be able to engage in it and use it authentically. We know that, but we have to be sensitive, we have to have the savvy and the skills to know what works best with each student, not just the best preparedness. I mean, they split time in ways that we never had to. They, uh, they fill up with jobs, clubs, church activities, sports, and not just one. Nuts. Driver's ed, doctor's appointments, right? Many have family duties. They have to watch siblings make dinner chores or work to support their family. Homework that does not get completed for these students ends up as a punishment. And let's call it what it is. Punish them enough for these mistakes and, and that are not fully under their control and they uh, believe that they can't do it. That school doesn't work for them, that learning is not for them. High standards are good. Punishment is bad. Uh, so we can't let homework be a punishment. Due dates. So if I give you an assignment today and tell you it's due next week on the same day, when are you going to start it? We as people do an amazing job of triage, I mean, deciding what is important and attending to it first. Uh, our students are even better at it. So does it really take seven days? It doesn't. Uh, by deciding the frame of time before it becomes important, we, in effect, delay the start. So the organization structure of due dates is ultimately not for students, it's for teachers. So choice, and we'll come back to the due dates now. So let me give you a choice. Uh, which would you rather do? Would you rather jump off a 10 meter diving platform or swim 100 meters in the pool? Dive, swim. So, who would choose hands up for swimming? Why? Shut up. You like swimming? Face it. What's that one? Less scary? That's a great question. Can you do both? Okay, so uh, hands up for jump. You notice there are a lot of different hands up. What? You don't like this one. Okay, yeah, what? Like to jump. <laughs> Why else? It's over fast. No effort. No effort. <laughs> it's very interesting. Is there anybody who would, uh, would choose nine? Can't swim. Okay. So, what am I trying to assess with an activity like this in my aquatic swimming? How about a 
basic water acclimation skills. Jump in, change direction, enough swimming to, uh, to get to safety, find the ball. In essence, the do you need water wings test, or the am I going to have to jump in and safety test, or do I need to design or make available a different activity that allows you to develop those skills in a safer environment? So, why does it matter what the learner learn thinks, knows, believes, or has experience? It matters because we each have this unique schema exposed by the way that you answered that question that allows us to do what we do. It's a network of experience-based knowledge that allows us to attend to new activities. Pause just for a moment. This will be the time we can add it up to the second. Those who would be fatigued easily by swimming 100 meters. That's a long distance. Others would really enjoy that. Those are experiences that you have, or things about you that I, as a teacher, am not as skilled at deciding for you as you are. You take into account all that you are and make decisions based on uh, where you'll eat, the clothes that you'll wear, the things that you'll do, also the decisions that you make in selecting activities or things that you're interested in. Takes into account that scheme and it's a value. So choice is really a paradigm to you. Uh, we're moving from a completely dictated curriculum to one built on choice. It'll take about 30 years, by the way, because that's the lag behind systemic change in society and change in education. Maybe longer. So we're living longer. We'll hold on tighter. So the teacher still creates, finds, and filters meaningful activity. But the students can use their schema and decide which of those is best today? And thus, engaging when we can par partner with them, we can come up with a new activity that we add to the spectrum. Now that there's a third choice, maybe it's just sitting in the hot tub, whatever we decide. Uh, or we can even put them together in groups or work with them individually. Play is that last piece, and we'll talk about how we make all this work. Um, a couple of interesting quotes. It's paradoxical that many educators still differentiate between a time for learning and a time for play without seeing the vital connection between the two. Uh, Trent Decker, uh, University of Calgary, said successful games teach us to play in the manner that we learn things. You're not here because you doubt whether that's actually true. You understand it, and now we all have the responsibility of helping communicate that foundational understanding to our colleagues. So, Educational gaming, for example, is more about effective feedback systems than it is about open, unbridled play. We like games because of the way they give us feedback, not because they're the most meaningful activity. Otherwise, I would go out right now with my club, kill and collect 10 squirrels, and then bring them back, only to be told I could go out there next with my slightly bigger club and kill 10 birds and bring them back. It's, it's not necessarily the activities that we choose in games that are the most compelling, but the way that we are rewarded and recognized for doing those things. The World Warcraft is a great example. And I, I spent 100 hours killing 10 of something and bringing it back. Maybe I didn't play it. And I didn't, and I didn't PvP or ever uh, read, so that's part of the problem. So, how do we do it? Uh, well, we call it quest based learning, and at Boise State we developed a game engine. Basically, for learning. You score points, you gain rank, you uh, earn badges and achievements, you complete quests, all for learning and doing. We built it because, frankly, no one else had and somebody needed to. Students uh, complete quests, which are individual, self contained learning activities. Right? Quests can be designed by teachers, students, or ideally both. Uh, they can offer experience that. Uh, Simply be as simple as read and respond, uh, watch this to uh, something broad like build your own game using these parameters. Uh, they can be tiered and leveled. Quests have deliverables uh, write this, build this, do this, create something, uh, demonstrate evidence in some way. Quests are linked with standards and categories for tracking student progress. Uh, completed quests earn experience points when they meet the teacher satisfaction. Students can submit a quest as many times as is needed to get it right. So failure becomes a learning tool 
and a part of the conversation is rather than Students are not bound to a singular path. They don't have to turn these in the same days as their classmates. They can choose the activities within the class that are compelling, regardless of why. Which is a powerful piece. Whether they think it's easy, easy doesn't mean easy, it just means that it fits more closely with their skin. Uh, they can do something their friends are doing, or they can choose something because it has the most points and they want to win the class faster. Um, these things don't matter because the tool tracks their progress those things that are important to us, they make decisions based on what's important to them. And sometimes those things go on. More often than not, they eventually go on together. So and I would invite you to visit my classroom uh, actually or virtually any time to see what this looks like in practice. It's not an online class, it's a face-to-face -face class. Um, and it's as dramatic as it is natural. Hundred students driven socially, intrinsically, and intrinsically to explore, create, compete, or just so I began using the tool as a primary learning management system in 2010, and I basically took a curriculum, and that's what we'll talk about today, an existing curriculum built in a gradebook, built up with modules, and convert, converted those readings, videos, and activities into quests. Students had the opportunity to complete those activities that they were interested in rather than being told what was the, the proper work. And skipped over those things that they were comfortable with um, and spent more time on those things that they really wanted to do. So the results of my class have been, you know, 97 students who took the course. Uh, when we, we, we're always testing it, but the testing I can talk about because I already was uh, brought in on the deal. Uh, 93 got A's or A pluses, right? There were no B's, there were no C's, there were no D's. Uh, and uh, there were four students. Uh, and actually, what's interesting about that is that that, that occurred because the course was designed for them to be successful, not to sort them uh, industrial model style, but to make them all successful, regardless of what scheme they came in. And uh, four students received incompletes. Uh, since that time, two of them have actually finished the course and got their And uh, two simply stopped doing it. The, uh, the reason that maybe it's, it's college, probably had that dorm mate who just was like, are you in class this semester? They're like, ah, oh, whatever, yeah. I'll just test it well. And then they're gone by some semester. You know, those folks, we had a couple of those. So, um, this approach has allowed tremendous freedom for me to play in the curriculum myself as a teacher and a designer. Because we can have these open dialogues, like you and I just have. Well, if not these, then what? Let me, let me be the arbiter of what we're trying to get to, but there's got to be a better way to do that when we can have a conversation with the students. Um, I'd like to pause. This is a, normally an unnatural point for the world of questions, but now that my 13 minute, five minute talk is done, ask a couple of questions. I will, I will sort of answer them, um, and then we'll kind of move in the direction that fits your needs the most. And I am going to talk directly about how you take an existing curriculum what it looks like when we break it out. And I'm going to show you some interactions in the system that we built and then some actual classes that are running right now. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that specifically. It's a tool that we built in the university. Within the university structure, our university, not everyone is like this, but um, every uh, department, in essence, except for a handful of tenure track folks, are all self-support. So we put a bunch of money into it, and then for about the last year and a half, we've been, we've been charging a fee to basically get access and for us to do the hosting. But yes, um, now that is, it's actually the process of tech transfer. Who's had to deal with tech transfer before? Um, I believe it was invented in the Middle Ages as another form of torture. It's horrible. Um, but if you've ever worked with a university, you realize that it does take three signatures to buy a box of Tic Tacs. It's more, it's, it's more. But, um, so it's now moving out of the university, so that makes it really easier. Do you want to see what it looks like when someone interacts with it? That'd be helpful to you? Okay, I'm going to go to my, um, yes, uh, they're very, very, very similar. Um, so I'll just bring you through the picture. 
pictures here, and then I'll, I'll drop you to a video, which I think is queued up correctly. Um, so this would be the student interface. You see a couple of the game paradigm uh, features. You see progress bars. The two progress bars at the top, one indicates, um, the top one actually indicates the amount of experience points necessary to complete this course. Now, XP doesn't have to be the only requirement of the course. You can create all sorts of badges and, and, uh, and other required deliverables for your course. But in this case, uh, that is the primary check. So that's the distance that the student has between start and finish, or where they are in finish. The one below is the next, is the distance to the next rank. So if I complete 165, or excuse me, 105, oh, excuse me, I have 165. If I complete 35 more points, I get to a new rank. In the case of this class, it will unlock new content, new material, things that I might be more interested in. Those who have played through the system uh, will tell you that that, uh, as Tom Chatfield describes, we all know Tom Chatfield, seven history of the brain. Um, I wish I had cool classes like him, but I don't. The, the what's in that treasure chest kind of uh, inquiry that, that we can drive the students by creating something that is just out of view but achievable. Um, you see the three columns right here, and I'll walk them to draw for the mouse here. The quests that are available to this student, the quests that are currently in progress, and then those that they have completed. They can view those at any time. We see the short description for a quest right here, which uh, includes the amount of experience points that it's worth, the amount of time it's currently trending to complete, and the user rating. Oh, you're not wrong. This, this is what we do. Yes. Or you can hand somebody an iPad in the classroom. Absolutely. There are none of these types of things that could not be completed or expanded out of the system. For example, the quest could be go get the food worksheet. Right? Complete it. Now, um, tell us what you thought of that experience. I would hate for it to be used that way. But, it's like Nobel and okay. I always get the two confused, Nobel and the other one, right? Yeah, exactly. See, but Nobel did not have a Minecraft. Did not. Like the gunpowder from uh, destroyed. Great course, thank you. Okay, um, this is the teacher side, the approval side. Um, you don't get to see all of it. Um, actually, I'll show you a good video. This is what badges, achievements, and rewards look like. Here's what the student uh, player card looks like. But I'll show you all of those in this video. QSAT. You can look like a game of five. In a typical class, everyone does the same thing. There's no way for me to pursue my interests, choose activities to support the way I learn best, or customize the experience. But in a game, there are lots of choices. I can choose from many different activities that all to the same learning condition. In class-based learning, it's the same. Class becomes a game where I can work towards winning and getting an A in class too. Now I can do it my way. Let me show you. Quests are individual lessons that add up to a class. But in a quest-based class, there are many more activities to choose from. In my quest-based biology class, I can choose activities that interest me right now. I can choose my category, experience points, keywords and tags, user ratings, and even how long it took other students. I can find out more about a quest before choosing it, including what other students have said about it. This can help me choose activities that work best for the way I learn. The quest itself can include all the video, text, and media I need to learn. Quests can be solo, cooperative, or even competitive with other players. Quests can be 100% web-based, or give directions for something to do in the classroom. It's great. When I finish it, I turn it in right there. I can give notes to my teacher about the activity, upload a file, or link to a website that has my finished work. It's so much fun. Then I get to add my feedback. How long did it take me? What do I rate this activity? What comments do I have for other students? All characteristics of the so many teachers we all interact with is my adjustment. Experience points for completing quests rather than letter grades. If my activity 
easy as not, right? My teacher's going to look back and change it so I can learn from my mistakes instead of getting penalized with a C. I can keep doing activities and leveling up until I get the grade that I want and make the class. It's amazing. Like a game, I can also earn the rewards, badges, and achievements for doing stuff in the game. I can get rewards for doing all sorts of things like finishing five quests in five days, great grammar or spelling, finishing groups of quests, just about anything you can imagine. Instead of the rainbow, I can see progress bars showing how far I have to go to the next level and the other class. Unlike a rainbow class, I always have the opportunity to learn from my mistakes and move forward in my ways. Because I'm choosing my path, I can finish the quests as fast or as slow as I need to go to get it right. I never feel behind and always know where I need to go. Sweet, I leveled up. Now I have tons of new quests available. This type of learning suits me better than a traditional grading class because I have a say in how I learn and get to make choices. I can always see where I stand and what I have to do to get to the next level, literally. This is what learning looks like in the future, and I love it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to the game. I mean, biology. I mean, biology. Raise your hand. Sit down in. Right? Um, hopefully, that clarifies a little bit more of what the work pattern is for students. Now, much of what he was describing is embedded, right? So here's a video, look at this, look at this. Much of the quest design that, that we're just currently out there is done that way. But that does not mean that, uh, that each of these quests can't have a short description, maybe a video, but then they get up and they go and experience something. Experience is the key. We can very didactically deliver instruction to folks. We're really good at that. We've been doing that since the games. Well, the problem is that it's not well received. But activities are different. The key being short activities. Read chapter five is not a short activity. Read these two paragraphs, or watch me read these two paragraphs. Read a screen reader is much more compelling, especially if that's something they can then do with that information authentically when they're done. And if we acknowledge and reward that process. Read chapter five is an unfunded mandate, right? You're not going to get credit in a traditional classroom for reading chapter five, unless there is some kind of journal assessment associated with chapter five. Even if you do what you're supposed to, you cannot get all points. We don't ever stop to analyze what's going on in that relationship. We often make assumptions. Well, you probably didn't read it, or and I really wasn't paying attention. So this D will make sure that next time we get what we want. And, and our colleagues, and many of our colleagues, struggle with this. You know, oh, kids these days, you know, you go into a lunchroom in the school, you, hopefully you don't get very often, but I'm sure it happens there. Without a real close look at what was the Share Sean's geekiness for those kind of minute little details that, that are really interesting. Well, why? Why did that happen? Was it that there was no value? Or was it all that? For many teachers, that's overwhelming. So I've got to design for this now, and I've got to pay attention to every student. I've got to know the name. Hopefully, hopefully that you know, they, they grab onto the same thing that, that excites us, which is it's really these future adults. These are really smart people. We're probably smarter than we are in a lot of areas. And isn't it fun to create things with them? Isn't it fun to see them excited and to be successful? Not just the 15% who will always do, but the 90% that we can reach because they have at least decided to do So that is the system. And before I, I dig into by the way, they're pretty creative people that do a lot of good stuff. Here's the problem that I have with these types of machines. I'll get to it. It's the 
I am so now built into the schema of the trackpad. The Apple trackpad with the two fingers, I'm trying to sweep and to do all sorts of things here, and I can't do it. Um, that, uh, So at the University of Wyoming, the, uh, the great system is leverage. It's a requirement. Part of my team is we all have to track the time. To prove that they're putting in enough time. And so uh, that can be complex when somebody really understands something. It doesn't need to put in enough time to meet the square foot of the So the issue then becomes when we frame these experiences out, um, and we decide how long it's going to take, that assumes the number of minutes that someone will fall into. And then major breakdowns can happen. And, and all of our efforts to accommodate any deviation from the path will be met with the three minute time to go through. It's still, what's, what's the million reason? Is it higher for some of you?
done in this bad way. So my class, the one I teach is from face to face class, is a combination of guided activities or rating so that I can make data that I can do in the classroom and understand the game from now on. Organized grades and, uh, and then open question time, which is often a collection of individuals working, not individuals, and small groups working to hack the project together, uh, to hack the math, to work together, to share resources. So I will announce, okay, on Tuesday, we're going to do this class together. I'm going to do a short demonstration of what's going to look like. Then we're going to go, we're going to come back together, we're going to show off. And anybody who wants to do this class, it's going to be fun. Come in.
so that uh, and it would require a certain components to be done. That is the collection of multiple requests for now, it's the reason we need that now, um, a collection of multiple requirements. So three of these five requests for urban spec, or 200 points in this category for urban spec for combination. There are this four. Because they're 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 talking more meaningfully about what they're doing. Except for this, I'm going to go to the infographic that I created based on a more recent study that we did. The the numbers that are out of date are those that are up here. We're close to 3,000 players, um, almost 300 teachers now nationwide. This was one course of 97 students. They were very engaged. Ratings over the course of the semester. Comments. Um, they earned a lot of badges, achievements, and awards. Some students very driven by those measures, others not at all. Um, the average student completed 37.1 activities during the course of the semester and spent an average of 34.8 minutes on each activity. There were some that were shorter, some that were longer. This, I think, is the most interesting and telling part. Each of those red lines represents one student's experience in experience points to the end of the course. You'll notice that the vast majority are above that A line, but even a frightening number continued to work throughout, and after they had won the course on things that they were interested in, they were no longer required to college class to keep coming. So to address you know, the concern, what do you do with it, with the framework, we actually allow them to continue on and learn other things, to go back and do things that they didn't want it to do, but just either didn't feel like they could attend to at that time, or weren't interested. One, uh, one more thing, when we talk about the organization of a, a class like this, let me show you. Um, I created this graphic right here, which shows you the activities that I created within a group. As they level up, through the course, more activities were available. So these were the first seven. As they completed however many points it required for them to, to get above that, you see the lines showing the prerequisite connections. So this wasn't available for the couple minutes. They couldn't, they couldn't write a log until they created a log, but they get credit for each of those activities. Creating a log meets a number of the standards also. So as they as they as they worked through the curriculum, they, uh, they were able to get more curriculum. We developed a, a new technique, more recently, I should see it this way, where we created a single key point. If you're interested in this topic or completing this thing, choose this point. They choose it, they complete it, they can give you one point, having no connection to any standard. But then it exposes the curriculum, right? These two quests first. When those two quests are done, these three, we can then scaffold and create what it looks like there. In the end, they get some kind of prize which says, hey, you did this activity or you completed this requirement for the course, our, our chapter five requirement. And they can do those in any order. If they want to do chapter five because their friend is, and do chapter three later, great. If our requirement is they have to get, they have to complete seven chapter badges, if we want to frame it that way, um, out of the possible nine, we again give them choice. Environment. The tool will allow us to track that. You can do this with your class with our tool or with any number of tools that allow you to give people certain things. There are plugins now that are available on lots of social networking sites that allow you to award badges to folks. And you can uh, build that in a grassroots kind of way as well. And I'd love to talk to you about the different ways that you can do it with post its and marketing, um, as I know some teachers have. I will just close with this because we're out of time. I, I hope that we can continue the conversation. I'm excited about uh, having that.
I've done this almost two years, the difference it has made for my students uh, in wishing that every class gave them the freedom to both investigate the things that were meaningful to them and to not be uh, held to my arbitrary restrictions of time, both in the high school level and uh, at the college level. And we're hearing the same in other environments as well. We have a few people here who are using the system and can uh, share their experience as well. But I hope that you'll, uh, you'll use me as a resource. I'll leave some cards up here, and I hope that you 